Welcome back to chapter 13. Let's go through our last part of chapter 13 and talk about warranties, contingent liabilities, and some common ratios that we use to analyze financial statements. So our first learning objective is to explain the issues and account for product guarantees, other customer program obligations, and unearned revenues. So let's start off with product guarantees and warranties. So a continuing obligation results when an entity provides customer programs requiring that goods or services be provided after the initial service is delivered. So for instance, if you think about when you buy a car, you know, you might get a three-year warranty against certain defects or two-year warranty. And you, would, you go into the dealership and you pay a certain amount for the car and the warranty just comes with it. And so that's a challenge from an accounting perspective as to how we will recognize that revenue. So there's two approaches to accounting for the outstanding liability. There's an expense approach, which is used for assurance type warranties. And there's a revenue approach, which is used for service type warranties. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So a warranty is a promise made by a seller to a buyer to correct problems experienced with the product's quality or performance. Warranties and product guarantees are stand ready obligations at the reporting date that result in future costs that are significant. And what's a stand ready obligation? Well, it's the type of a liability where it's unconditional that the person that's endorsed that warranty will fulfill it whenever it's required. So the two types of warranties, as we mentioned before, are an assurance type warranty and a service type warranty. So an assurance type warranty is where the uh, cost of the warranty is often just included in the good itself. So in the example that we talked about where we, you know, we buy a car for $30,000 and there's a five-year warranty, there's no specific amount that we're paying for the warranty, it just comes with the car in that situation. So that would be similar to an assurance type warranty. And so, how we account for an assurance type warranty is we, the associated expense is measured and matched to the revenue. So when we pay that $30,000 for the car, we need to then estimate how much that warranty is going to cost us over those three years and match it to the same period. The liability is measured at the estimated cost of meeting the obligation and the actual cost as incurred. So whenever that warranty um, requires to be made due, um, those costs are expensed and the liability is reduced. And there's no impact on future income, assuming that the warranty is the same amount or the, the expense under the warranty is the same amount that we thought it was when we set it up. Then we've already accrued that expense from the get-go when we sold the car. So as long as that expense is the same as what it actually ends up being over those three years, there will be no impact on net income. The next type is a service type warranty. So this is where, you know, when you go through the cash register, they say, would you like to purchase the one-year product defect warranty? Um, and so that's where you say, okay, yes, it'll cost $10, I'll, I'll pay it. And that's where there's a, usually a revenue amount coming from that. And that's why it's the revenue approach. That $10 that the store receives for the warranty in that scenario um, would need to be recorded as unearned revenue. And the liability will be measured at the value of the service. So that, that, that unearned revenue amount. And as the, the revenue is earned over the warranty service period, so let's say it's a, a two year $10, $10 warranty, then they would recognize $5 each year. And they'd also recognize whatever expenses were incurred um, in each of those years as well to make due on that warranty. So let's look at two examples. Let's look at an assurance type warranty. So in this one, we've got sales of 100 units at $5,000 each during 2020. We provide a one year assurance type warranty. There's an estimate of $200 per warranty cost. And they incurred $4,000 in actual warranty cost during the first year. And then they expect another 16,000. So the first entry we're gonna record is actually just the sale of the units. So we look at warranty as a separate entry. So the first entry we're gonna record is just debit, accounts receivable, credit sales revenue for the 10 times the 5,000. So that's our 500,000 there. Then as we incur the warranty costs, it says that we're gonna incur $4,000 in warranty costs during the first year. So as we incur the 4,000, we're gonna debit warranty expense, and then we're gonna credit whatever the amount is. So it might be a credit to AP, it might be a credit to 
cash. It might be a credit to, to what have you. And then at year end, before we close our statements, we're gonna to need to say, whoa, wait a minute. We have recorded revenue from the sale of these goods and we've already incurred some amount to fulfill that warranty, but this is a two year warranty. Is it two years? This is a, a one year warranty, sorry. This is a one year warranty. So we know that we're still gonna have an ongoing obligation. This must be part way through the year. So we expect another $16,000. And we're just going to set that up uh, as a liability. So we're going to go debit warranty expense. So it's going to go through our income statement. We're accruing that cost and then credit warranty liability on our statement of financial position. So in the following year, as the costs are incurred, they're going to reduce our liability. We're not going to put them through the income statement again. And then any difference between what we actually had to pay out and the amount that we set up, we would flush that through net income. Let's look at an example of a service type warranty. So in this example, there's a date of sale of equipment January 2nd. The total price of equipment, including the two-year warranty was $20,000. The estimated standalone value of the two-year warranty, if it was purchased separately, is 1,200. And we assume $423 were incurred in 2020 to service the warranty. So the first thing as usual is that we're gonna record the sale of the units. Now, the difference is the $1,200 that we got as part of the 20,000 for the warranty, um, we, we, need to, we need to recognize that as unearned revenue. So in this case, we're gonna say cat, we got cash of 20,000, we got sales revenue of 20,000 minus the 1,200 for the warranty. And then we're gonna set up the 1,200 as an unearned revenue. We're going to remeasure the unearned revenue at the year end, at, at year end. So the first thing we're gonna do is recognize the $600 where it says we had incurred $423 were incurred to service the warranty. So that's the bottom entry here where we're recognizing the amount we had to service the warranty. Um, this warranty is for two years. So we set up $1,200. So at the end, assuming that we sold it at the very beginning of the first year, we're gonna recognize half of the revenue at the end of the first year. So we're gonna go debit unearned revenue, credit warranty revenue. And that's literally just amortizing that unearned revenue through the income statement. And then we're also going to be recording the warranty expenses as they incur. So we incur, incurred $423. So we're going to go debit warranty expense and then credit cash or AP. Okay. And so here, actually, just to go back for a second. So what's important to know is that you've got revenue coming through your top line, you're going to have warranty revenue, and then you're also going to have a warranty expense. So in this case, it's actually being presented gross. So in your net income, the net net income is going to be just the difference between the 600 and the 423, but you're going to see the two amounts going through your income statement gross. Okay. Product guarantees and warranty obligations. So this is really just to let you know that if the warranty is completely immaterial um, or the warranty period is super short, it's like 30 days, then some companies account for that on a cost basis. Um, so it can only be done if it's immaterial or for in, on, it's done for income tax, but it's not done for financial reporting if it is material. All right, so we've talked about warranties. What about other type of customer lo loyalty obligations? So as you probably know, there's all sorts of different loyalty programs out there. So there's Shepherd's Drug Mart points, there's PC points, there's Air Miles, there's um, Petro Canada points, there's just a whole variety of different types of point or loyalty programs. The question is like, how do we account for that? From an, How do we account for those types of um, those types of loyalty programs. And so there's a small difference here between IFRS and ASPE, nothing really material I, in theory. So IFRS recognizes the promise to provide the goods as part of the performance obligation. So the fair value of the rewards needs to be recognized as a liability. So if you spend, let's say you spend a thousand dollars on your credit card and uh, let's say it's a thousand dollars interest just to keep it simple. And let's say that of that thousand dollars interest that the bank's going to record, they're also going to have to settle an amount with an airline for the points that you earned on those purchases. And let's say that those points were three dollars, then they would need to recognize only ninety seven dollars of revenue and have the three dollars being set up as.
as a liability, as unearned revenue. And then they would recognize that as the rewards are redeemed. ASPE, specifically the standards don't address loyalty programs, but there's a general principle that revenue needs to be bifurcated according to the different performance obligations. And so same thing, they're gonna set it up as a liability as unearned revenue. There's also premiums and other benefits. So this is where um, companies are, or, or, or manufacturers are rewarding customers for purchasing certain products. You know, you might send in a UPC code to get a cash discount, or um, there might be different ways that you get some sort of a, you know, you send in three UPCs of different cereal and you get some money back. Um, so, or you get some sort of a gift. And so there, we need to think about that from an accounting perspective too. So we need to think about, if we're gonna recognize the sales revenue, we need to think about matching. So we need to figure out what a reasonable accrual of the expense associated with whatever that promise is, and then we're expensing that in the current period. Um, there's also cash received in advance for a specific goods or services to be performed in the future always needs to be set up as un unearned revenue. And the unearned revenue amount would be the fair value of the outstanding obligation. And we'll recognize the revenue as the goods or services are delivered. Okay, moving on. Learning objective number seven. Now we're gonna start talking about contingencies, uncertainties and commitments and identify how we're gonna account for those. What is a commitment? So the question is, does an obligation actually exist at the statement of financial position, at the statement of financial position date? And what is the amount required to settle the obligation? So under ASPE, a contingency is defined as an existing condition or situation involving uncertainty as to a possible gain or loss to an enterprise that will ultimately be resolved when one or more future events occur or fail to occur. So there's kind of a nuance here in terms of in terms of terminology. So I for us and ask we define a contingent loss differently. So both IFRS and ASPE are going to recognize a provision or some amount on the statement of financial position for say a pending lawsuit, assuming that it meets certain criteria. Both of them are going to do that, but they use different terminology here. So ASPE considers that a contingent liability. We just saw the definition, so it's, there's uncertainty. Maybe we'll win, maybe we'll lose. It depends what happens. Um, and so they consider that a contingent loss. That's their definition. And so under ASPE, we're gonna accru accrue that loss if it's probable and the loss can be reasonably estimated. So the thing is IFRS actually considers contingent losses only losses that are not recorded. So of course it's gonna say that it doesn't recognize contingent losses, but what IFRS does is it, it considers those amounts provisions. So if it's more likely than not that a present obligation exists, um, then an amount needs to be accrued for that potential event. Um, and so that's the criteria there. So ASPE says that it needs to be probable and IFRS says more likely than not. So arguably probable is 50% and more likely than not is possibly 51%. So arguably IFRS is a little bit more lenient here just by that 1%. So IFRS considers these amounts to be liabilities, not contingent liabilities. And um, yeah, it's a possible obligation where the existence is gonna be confirmed by an uncertain event that may or may not occur. And in both situations, if the amount cannot be measured reliably, then no liability is recognized. We also have to disclose quite a bit of information about contingencies or these uncertain events in the financial. So we need to disclose the nature of the contingency, the estimated amount of the loss, or a statement that an estimate cannot be made, the extent of the exposure to losses in excess of the amount that we provided, and um, Disclosures about uncertain amounts under IFRS, an estimate of the financial impact, whether any reimbursements are possible. ASPE says the liability recognition criteria are not met, so that you need to clearly explain if you're not providing and that the amount of, and the amount of the loss exposure uh, that could be above the amount accrued. 
Same thing. So here's just a recap of everything that we've said here in commitment. So I, for us, you're going to recognize it if the occurrence of a future event is probable, meaning more likely than not. You're going to measure the amount at the probability weighted expected value. So if there is, you know, a 10% chance this could happen and a 90% chance this could happen, you're going to measure it that way. And for ASPE, you're going to recognize it if it's likely and you're going to measure it at your best estimate. And IFRS generally requires more disclosure than ASPE. A common type of uh, contingency or uncertain commitment relates to a lawsuit. So you might not know if you're going to win the lawsuit. It's possible you'll win. It's possible you'll lose. So to recognize a loss and a liability, the litigation must have occurred on or before the statement date. It doesn't matter if management was aware of it, but the claim has to be before the financial statement date. Um, to, to evaluate the likelihood, you're going to consider the nature of the litigation, the progress of the case, the opinion of legal counsel, you'll get a legal letter, experience of the company management's response. And estimating the amounts of amount of the loss is really challenging in these situations. It can be done, but generally there's not a lot of disclosure around it because it could be proprietary towards the company and they don't want to bias themselves in the ongoing litigation. Okay, moving on. Now let's talk about financial guarantees. So what's a financial guarantee? It's where one party contracts to reimburse the second party for a loss if the party doesn't make the required payment. So you might, for instance, you might, um, have some sort of an arrangement with your accounts receivable, whereby if you don't receive 100% collection, you know, another party guarantees it and you pay them some sort of a premium for that. And this qualifies as a financial liability because the guarantor, the guarantor has an unconditional obligation to transfer cash. So IFRS recognizes this at fair value, we're usually equal to that premium charged. And if there's more of a loss, then that would go through the income statement. And ASPE considers this the same as a loss contingency. So this is stepping back here. So this, this slide applies to the, the presentation and disclosure of all current liabilities. So normally the first classification in the liability statement in the liability section, sorry, of the statement of financial position are your current liabilities. I4S does allow like a backwards income statement where your current liabilities are at the bottom. I'm sorry, balance sheet, but that's not common. It is allowed though. Within each section, the accounts can be listed in order of maturity or liquidity. And IFRS just requires quite detailed descriptions and reconciliations in the notes for provisions. And any unrecognized loss contingencies are disclosed. And there's more information provided under IFRS. Okay. So now let's talk about how non-financial and current liabilities are presented and analyzed in the statement. So there's some ratios that, uh, that are commonly used to think about how liabilities are playing out on our balance sheet. So identifying current liabilities separately from long-term obligations is important because it provides information about the company's liquidity. Liquidity is their ability to convert assets into cash and pay off liabilities in the ordinary course of business. So a really common ratio that's used here is the current ratio. And this shows how many dollars of current assets are available for each dollar of current liabilities. So you're gonna simply take your current assets and divide it by your current liabilities. Two other really common ratios that are used are the asset test or quick ratio, which is where you just take your quick assets. So like cash, investments, receivables, which are readily convertible to cash. And you compare that to your current liabilities and see how that ratio is moving. And last but not least is days payable outstanding. And this is gonna give um, uh, an analyst an idea of how long it takes a company to pay its trade payables. So you're gonna take the days payable outstanding. So, sorry, you're gonna take the trade, trade you're going to take your AP amount and you're going to divide it by the average daily cost of goods sold. And then that's going to give you your day's payable outstanding. Last but not least, learning objective number nine, our very last learning objective for chapter 13. So we're just going to quickly recap what's going on between IFRS and ASPE and what changes are, what changes are coming. And there's not a lot of changes here. So, um, 
the, uh, the IASB is continuing to look at how to account for liabilities and contingencies, and they may be starting a project to amend IAS 30, 37, but uh, nothing too much on the docket there. And that's it. That concludes chapter 13. Please join me for some tutorial questions to look at some examples of how to work through an, a question for chapter 13, part two.